know me? My name is Mike Giovanazzo, and I've been running the Meetup Group here in Ottawa for a little over 10 years. Uh, I joined the group because I wanted to meet other photographers, and I was fairly new to Ottawa at the time. I was involved with the RA Photo Club and was one of their instructors, was on the executive, etc. But then the Meetup Group uh, grew and grew and grew, and so when I took, took it over, there was about 60 people. Now we're about 3,000. So uh, <laughs> it's become almost uh, my, my, my full-time job and my passion and luckily I'm retired so I've got a lot of time to, to do sessions like this and to organize events. So I, I see a lot of nature photographers and, and event photographers uh, tonight. Uh, I mean if you guys are heading out to I don't know Mud Lake and you want to take pictures of some nature shots and you, you're, you're thinking of going there Saturday, let me know you're going Saturday and I'll just say hey you know uh, you know, so and so is going to Mud Lake on Saturday. They'll be there on 11. If anyone else wants to join them, great. And then next thing you know, you've got a meetup happening. And worst that happens is you go alone like you were planning on doing anyways. Uh, I try to co organize events as well and uh, try to make the events as broad as possible. So last week we had a football team, we were doing some sports stuff. Uh, tomorrow we've got uh, some high key, low key stuff in studio. Uh, I'm always trying to create different events. I have one group which is general photography, nature, landscape, etc. And the other group is the auto photographer model meetup group and that's more about people and it's, it's more about portraiture and boudoir and, and uh, cosplay and whatever. So uh, I keep that group separate because we had some people who were saying oh, I really don't want to see your, 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 your you know, your pretty ladies in, in, in my feed. I, I, you know, I just want to see, you know, my birds and my flowers and that's fine. So we just keep the group separate and uh, join whatever group that you want. But regardless of the group and your interests, uh, we all have one thing in common and that is we're using cameras. So let me uh, open up my little presentation here. And whoops, hopefully my wife will get that. And let me share my screen. Uh, start recording. Nope. I share screen. Uh, view full screen. Start recording. Share video. Do, do, do. Where is the share screen button? There it is, share screen. Okay, it took me a moment to find it. It's always different. <laughs> All right, so uh, getting to know your camera is, well, let's change the displays, swap presenters, and there we go. So hopefully people can see the title slide here. I will keep the, um, the chat window open so if you see something or, or you want to interrupt at any point in time by all means or unmute yourself if you're muted and you hit the space bar you'll temporarily be unmuted as long as your finger hold your finger on the space bar and one of the advantages of coming to this presentation is be able to ask questions as you go along so I don't mind sort of being interrupted as we go along and, and, and that way you get more out of the session um, if uh, you miss the session and you're watching this on video, then obviously there won't be any questions for you. So let me just find the session here. I think a couple of people are still not muted. There we go. And I'm just looking for, oh, I think I, I whoever was not muted is, seems to be muted now, so we'll, we'll keep going. All right, so I've been doing photography for quite a long time, and you know, many, huge people, many people ask me how long you've been doing this. And I usually look at them and say, I think longer than you've been alive. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I enjoy it. It's it's something that has uh, is, is been with me. It, it comes and goes depending on how busy you are, right? I mean, if you've you've got you know young kids and whatnot, you, you've got to put family first. If you're uh, you know, retired like I am, you've got a lot more time for photography. So it's, it's come and gone throughout the years, depending on, on how busy I am. But uh, I've, I've come to love it. I love to share it with other people. And one of my great pastimes and, and, and enjoyments is watching people publish things uh, on Flickr or Facebook or Instagram or any social media. And I'm seeing photos that I know they couldn't have done five months ago, six months ago. So they've come to the meetups. They've learned about how to use their flash. They've learned how to use the camera. They've learned how to use... 
uh, posing techniques, whatever, and, and they're now doing stuff that they weren't able to do, you know, some time ago. And, and it, it's to me, that's, that's, that's I like seeing people grow. <clears throat> so that's uh, that's very nice. So the topics we'll be talking about today is getting a grasp of your camera basics, essentially, you know, picking, you know, picking a camera, picking lenses, you know, understanding exposure, doing those cre creative trade-offs. I mean, you can use your camera in automatic mode and, and there's no reason why you shouldn't. There are times when that's very, very um, opportunistic to use the, 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 the automatic mode. And we pay a lot of money for these cameras and they've got four or five automatic modes. And uh, I mean, why pay for it if you're not going to use it? But at the same time, uh, if you want to have better control of your picture and to be creative, then you sometimes have to ship, go away from automatic or, or tune your automatic to give you the, the type of image you're looking for. And then we'll talk about some of the technical things like histograms and depth of field and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, how to choose your modes. Once we get through that, depending on how time goes, then we, we will probably go through the, the elements of composition. That's a whole separate class that we could do, but it really talks about how to create better pictures, you know, so that uh, the viewer is looking at your photo and seeing something that you want them to see, and it really doesn't matter, you know, uh, what camera you had, etc. Uh, you, once you've mastered the basics of, of the camera, you could be using an iPhone, uh, you could use a, a very expensive camera, but, you know, composition is, is, is getting that right image in, the, in your photo, uh, in your um, apparatus, and having the viewers see something that you want them to see. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the composition, the rules, how to you know, use perspective, and how to some, create some of that wow factor in, in your images. Okay, I just pause every now and then, make sure there's no questions. <laughs> so photo gear. Uh, cameras really don't matter to me. I mean, the best camera is the one you have with you. Uh, you can use your, your phone, you could use a, a mirrorless camera, when it's sort of an old fashioned sort of, you know, Leica that your grandfather gave you really, really doesn't matter. The, the camera captures light. That's what you want it to do. A lot of people get into sort of gear envy and are always, you know, looking at the latest and greatest and so on and so forth. And, and I often just look at, you know, the, the latest announcements and I say, okay, what's it offering that I don't already have? And quite frankly, sometimes it's, you know, this picture, this phone takes, you know, pictures at, you know, 25 frames per second. I'm going, I shoot in the studio. I shoot models. And I go click, click, click. I don't need 25 images a second. So if you're a sports photographer, well, maybe it's a, that's something you need. So look at the cameras, not in terms of, you know, all the bells and whistles they contain, but, you know, does it have anything that you need or want? I have a lot of people who use, you know, cell phones for their photos. And they say, Mike, I want to be able to take better pictures. You know, what camera should I have? And I'm going, what's wrong with your cell phone? What can't you do with your cell phone? And if they can't answer the question, then stick with it. I mean, if you say, well, I've got my cell phone, but you know, I can't connect a flash to it. I want to be able to do flash photography and off camera flash. Okay, now you have a reason to move forward. Or I want to be able to shoot underwater, or I want to be able to shoot, I don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, high resolution pictures so that I can you know, blow them up to, to you know, uh, you know, 12 feet by 18 feet or something. But I always look at the gear in terms of, you know, what's it, what's it going to do for me that I can't already do with my current uh, gear? Uh, the camera, interestingly enough, uh, has a certain role and it is to capture light as we talked about. And then the quality of the image and a lot of that type of stuff really comes out of your lens. So if you're going to do anything, uh, be a little careful <laughs> about which lenses you pick. So. The, the camera is really just a tool and, 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 you know, this business of, oh gosh, this meal tastes great. What kind of pots and pans did you use to cook it? I mean, it really doesn't matter what pots and pans you had to cook it. I mean, the, the, the chef knows how to mix the ingredients together to, to achieve the, uh, the right taste, the right meal. And, and as a photographer, you learn to, you know, use the tools of the camera, you know, its f-stop setting, its shutter speed setting, its ISO settings, the various choice of lenses, your choice of perspective and, and, and positioning to take a picture. And, and once you take those ingredients away, you know, the, the amount of light, the, 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 the style of lens, etc., you could just switch the camera from a Nikon to a Canon to a whatever, and the result will essentially be the same. 
So, so learn to use what you have and, and get really, really good at the equipment you have before you say, oh gosh, you know, um, I'm trying to do close up macros and I want to do something called focus stacking and my camera doesn't do focus stacking. I have to do it all manually and it's, it's, it's problematic because every time I touch the camera focus ring it moves a little bit and I gotta realign my photos and okay now, now you've just found a reason to move to another camera and looking for a very specific feature. So, so you know once you've learned to use your camera really well then I think you'll, you'll be much happier with it <laughs> regardless of what you already have. And the cameras you know uh, tend to, to wear out at some point in time, they, they, you can drop them, they, 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 the, the shutter wears out and that kind of stuff. I do a lot of photography and most shutters are rated, most cameras are rated with for a shutter of something like uh, 200,000 to 400,000 clicks and I can do that in a year. It's not unusual for me to literally wear out a DSLR within two years. So my lenses I've had for 10 years. So <laughs> your lenses will outlive your camera. So spend a little bit of money on a lens and, and uh, you'll be happy. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy in terms of the gear and I recognize that mobile phones have come a long long way and there's some amazing photographs that people are doing with mobile phones. So <clears throat> I've given over the years my, my, my daughter and son sort of you know nice cameras for their uh, Christmas presents, birthday presents over time and, and quite frankly it's not something they, they found themselves using. Whenever the kids were doing something really neat or they were on vacation, they didn't have their fancy camera. They just used their phones. And so they've they've come accustomed to, to taking photographs with their phones. And quite frankly, the, the, the industry has moved away from fancy cameras, uh, except for people who really want to do some artistic stuff. So again, it's, it's you know, the, the phones have now gotten controlled, manual controls, they're not automatic, you can use your iPhone or whatever and set f-stops and shutter speeds and ISOs. So everything we're talking about will apply to any camera including your mobile ones. So that said, there's a whole bunch of different styles of cameras out there. And so the things that set them apart are number one, interchangeable lenses or not interchangeable lenses. Some cameras have a lens built in, like a, a camera phone or ultra compact or compact, etc. And those that lens is attached to the phone and uh, to the, the camera, and that's what you get. Uh, so if you need to be able to start playing with lenses and start moving from you know um, big huge telephoto lenses to very wide angle or, or, or um, fisheye etc., well then you need a camera with an interchangeable lens. So so that's one of the differentiators between the various cameras. Uh, the ability to use flash. So if you look at your camera phone, your ultra compact, the compact and the large sensor one that's on the corner there seems to have a, a hot shoe on it. But having a hot shoe it lets you put a flash on your camera or put a trigger on your camera so that you can control a flash separate. And so, you know, the ability to control flash is another one. But again, you know, if I use my, my, my cell phone as my example, we're starting to see some new technology where the cell phone is using technology such as Bluetooth to talk to an external flash. So already we're starting to see ways of attaching um, flash to, to phones and we're seeing people who have clamp-on lenses and other types of, of attachments that they can put on their phone as well. So, so you know, again, this whole business of interchangeable lenses used to be the domain of the, the, the DSLR and Pro DSLR and the, the lately the, the mirrorless, but um, you know these are some of the differentiators are disappearing. You know how about underwater? Do you need to be able to have a, a waterproof camera to be able to shoot? You know, um, the, <laughs> while you're snorkeling, uh, do you want to be able to do movies? Do you want to be able to shoot ultra fast pictures? So you're doing sports photography and you're trying to do uh, you know 20 frames per second. Uh, do you need to blow up your, your, your pictures really, really large, in which case you absolutely need a huge sensor in, in order to, to get appropriate pictures? I mean, I find that many pictures these days are going on to the social media and between Instagram and Facebook and so on, and literally a one megapixel picture looks fine on a phone. It looks great. You don't need, you know, 30 megapixels in order to put up a Facebook post. <clears throat> so, I mean, do you really, really need a large sensor? There, there's trade-offs to, to, to doing that. You know, yes, your pictures might be sharper and you might have more room for cropping, 
but uh, you know your depth of field starts to suffer if you have a very large sensor. So th these are the kinds of things that you, you need to kind of understand and, and trade off. So I don't encourage people to run out and buy equipment and gear. Uh, I encourage people to, to learn to use the, the, the cameras that they have, use the different modes that the, your cameras come with. And from my perspective, if you do that, uh, you'll be a much more successful and much uh, happier photographer. And your, your, your wallet will be happier too. <laughs> so tonight, what we're going to be doing is learning to use our camera a little bit better. Okay, so lenses. That's the next big thing to talk about and lenses will make a huge difference to your photography. It'll start giving you different perspectives. It'll start giving you different um, ways of seeing the world and uh, which lenses you, you, you use will, will uh, I guess, give you a certain amount of flexibility in, in photography. If you have only type one lens and you want to take certain types of pictures, you'll find yourself constrained because the lens doesn't quite let you do what you want to do. <clears throat> so, um, what's important about lenses is they match up with your camera. And so, if you start investing in lenses and you start owning two, three, four, five, six lenses, and you've got a Canon camera and a whole bunch of Canon lenses, it's really hard to then say, you know what, I'm not happy with Canon anymore, I want to go to Sony or whatever, and try to move all of your lenses over to a new body. Uh, there are times when you can do that, there's some adapters and other things you can buy, but by and large, the lenses are designed for a certain camera body, uh, not camera body, for a certain uh, manufacturer body, and uh, therefore, once you start down the road and you get more and more into photography and you have more and more lenses, you're kind of sort of committing to a specific vendor and you're going to commit to Canon or, or Nikon or Sony or whoever you want. So uh, as soon as you start buying lots of lenses, you, you'll find that's a, a difference. You'll also find the lenses tend to be linked to the size of your sensor. So if you get a full frame sensor, you'll probably want lenses that support full frame. If you get a smaller sensor, a three-quarter uh, type uh, sensor for your camera, or you buy a camera with a what they call a crop sensor, then you know you can get you know, lenses that fit that form factor and they tend to be cheaper. So the more up you go with a camera and the more you move towards full uh, full size sensor, then you essentially end up with more expensive lenses in, in the process as well. So everything becomes more expensive as you move up the, the ladder. Uh, I skipped over mirrorless um, when I was talking about the cameras. That's becoming the thing and quite frankly I moved to mirrorless about two years ago now and I wouldn't go back. The, 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 the mirrorless camera gives you a certain degree of capability that a few years ago we only saw in phones. Now we're seeing it in cameras and we'll talk about some of those differences as we go along. And so, and I know I talk fast, so if you need to interrupt, just go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the lenses, uh, essentially, the trade-offs in the lenses are whether or not you want an all-in-one lens, sometimes referred to as a zoom lens, so it can be, you know, a range of, you know, let's say 17 millimeter to 40 millimeter or 70 millimeter to 200 millimeter. Uh, versus what we call a prime lens, and a prime lens is only a certain focal length. So the focal length is really how the lens sees the world. Our eyes typically approximate what would be about a 50 millimeter lens. So how wide, how, how wide we see as a human being is approximately 50 millimeter. If we want to look wider, we have to turn our head left or right to be able to see an, an entire landscape. If you take a lens which is less than 50 millimeter, so 35 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 18 millimeter, it's seeing wider and wider and wider, and therefore uh, it's taking in more of the landscape. And you can see, you know, you'd have to turn your left, turn your head left to to, to see, you know, one part of the the uh, the landscape. Turn your head right to see the other part of the landscape. Whereas your lens can see it all. And so everything looks smaller, everything looks further away, but you can take more of your, your, your imagery you know, in. And so you know, for landscape and whatnot, you know, wide angle lenses are, are great. If you want to do birding, then you want to go the opposite. You want to get a telephoto lens. So now you don't want a lens in the 17 or 20 or 50 range. You want numbers like 200, 300, 400. Uh, you know, uh, some people have 800. I mean, you, know, you can start spending 
$12,000 on a lens. <clears throat> and what it's doing is it's bringing like a binocular, it's bringing a picture right up close. So it's seeing a very, very narrow uh, uh, piece of the, uh, the view in front of you. Instead of seeing you know, a whole uh, tree in front of you, you're looking at one particular bird on one particular branch, you know, uh, 200 feet in front of you. And so that's what the, the, uh, the telephoto lenses do. So if you have a prime lens and it's a 400 millimeter lens, literally it's going to see you know a, a very small object very far away and bring it in close. Great for birds, great for le uh, wildlife, uh, that type of thing. If you tried to shoot people with 400 millimeter lens, I mean you'd be shooting their eyebrow from you know across the room. Uh, you can't step back and get a whole you know head to toe shot. It, the lens just is, is, is you know coming in too too tight. Uh, if you try to shoot a person with a 17 millimeter lens, well, you can do it, but uh, it, it's it's going to take in a lot of the room and the person. It's going to make them look really, really small. And if you try to get close enough to 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 just make them fit into the the picture, uh, then you're going to be distorting the person, and it's it's not going to look natural. So different lenses tended to have different uh, applications, and uh, you know. When someone says, well, you know, I want to do portraiture or whatever, well, I know that they're going to be needing lenses somewhere in the vicinity of, let's say, 85 to 125. If they want to start doing landscape, they probably want something closer to, you know, 24 to, to, to 50 or something like that. Um, and then as you get, you know, really, really telephoto or really, really... Um, wide these become very special purpose application lenses the, the, your your average pictures don't really need a you know 7 millimeter lens or seven, uh, a 700 millimeter lens um <clears throat> okay we'll top finish that okay so we talked a little bit about um, the telephoto versus macro versus the 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 the, the wide angle so prime then becomes a lens that has one special purpose and it is only one focal length. So you put the lens on your camera and all you can do with it is focus. The, the, the lens, if you want to get something bigger, you get, you get closer. You zoom with your feet. You walk up to the object to, to make it look closer. If you can't get it all in and you're trying to get somebody in and it's, you're only shooting from the waist up, and you want to get their feet in the picture, you could literally have to back up. And if the wall's behind you and you can't back up, well, then that's as, that's as wide as you can get. You, you can't go any, any wider. You can't do anything with your lens. Whereas the zoom lens lets you dial you know, a wider, uh, a different focal length. So uh, zoom lenses are certainly a lot more um, popular. They're, they're, they're uh, shall we say, uh, more flexible. Uh, instead of carrying a, a 17 millimeter lens and a 25 uh, and a 35 and a 50, you can get a lens that goes from, you know, 14 to 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 let's say 50 or 24. I th I've actually got one that goes from 24 all the way to 200, so that covers pretty much anything. But there's a downside: the lens which has uh, such a wide coverage tends to be a little less crisp, a little less clear. The people who are purists love to have prime lenses. The lens is designed uh, to shoot at 50 millimeter or whatever it's, it's designed to shoot at, and it only does that. Whereas as you're, if you're an engineer and you understand how the optics work, and you're trying to design a lens that goes from, let's say, um, 24 to, two, to 240, well, that's a, that's a factor of 10. 24 times 10 is 240. That's a factor of 10. That's, that's a huge amount of uh, compromise that's necessary to be able to get it to shoot at 24 and to shoot it at 240 and everything in between. So the, there's usually a little bit of compromise that gets made in the design of the lens. <clears throat> now, is the average person going to see that? I mean, you and I don't sit there with, you know, uh, optical measuring devices and try to measure the quality of the lens. Uh, we're just going to take a picture of our grandkids or our vacation or whatever and we put it in an album or put it up on Facebook and, and, and we're happy with it. Uh, but if you want, you know, super, super critical, you know, pictures, and you want to be able to take a picture of a bird at a, at a certain distance, and then be able to, you know, count the feathers, you know, on its wing, well, then you're starting to need really, really sharp lenses, and uh, you're going to start paying some some good money for that. So uh, I tend to, for the stuff that I do, and I do weddings, and I do, you know, portraiture and all kind of stuff, 
and, and I'm more than happy with my zoom lenses. Uh, I, I don't really feel that uh, I'm, I'm suffering tremendously to, to, to give up. But, you know, if you're trying to do a wedding and you're trying to switch between, you know, four or five different lenses all the time, you're losing a lot of opportunity to photo, to capture the moment because you're sitting there fumbling with your equipment all the time. So, uh, so th th there's trade-offs. So the wide angles, as I mentioned, see much wider. <clears throat> the way they do that is they, 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 they change the, the field of view. And in the process, what ends up happening is they end up distorting the image. So it's not unusual to try to do um, a picture of a building or something like that with a wide angle. And all of a sudden, the building starts to curve a little bit. You know, the edges aren't you know, super straight. Um, and, and so that's just the, a natural part of the, the lenses. Uh, that's part of the design. So it, it bends the, the, the optics in order to be able to make everything fit in the frame. So you need to be a little careful in terms of you know how you photograph people and certain things with wide angle lenses. Uh, but the, the the advantage is is you know you can get some nice panoramas if you don't have a wide angle lens and this is why I say you know learning to use your camera if you 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 don't have a wide angle lens and you want to catch a panorama we learned with our phones that we could take multiple pictures and, and have the phone stitch them together well if you don't have a phone or something that's stitching them together you can some cameras in fact have it in, built into the camera but uh, you can always take you know three or four pictures side by side and then go into Photoshop and stitch them together. And so, you know, do you really need to carry an extra lens with you on vacation? If you've just learned the technique of stitching together photos, you literally could take, uh, you know, three pictures side by side of the Hoover Dam and stitch them together. And now you've got this nice wide angle view of the Hoover Dam. Or you could take uh, a number of pictures of this, you know, gigantic redwood uh, in, in BC or whatever and take a picture of the bottom of the tree, the middle of the tree, the top of the tree and stitch them together and now you've got this really 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 tall portrait uh, image of this amazing tree. So that's the kind of thing that we're, we're talking about. Telephoto does the opposite. It focuses on something very very small very far away. So if you have um, a, a telephoto lens and you want to be able to shoot that bird or, or that you know um, flower or whatever that's you know 10 feet away from you and you can't step into the flowers because it's a it's a an important garden in a, in a historic uh, site uh, you can stay you know five six seven feet away from that flower and still get a nice close-up because you know you're using a, a telephoto lens you don't have a telephoto lens well then you know maybe you only have a 50 or an 85 and you need a 200 take the picture anyways and then crop it so that's essentially what's happening when you're taking a telephoto is you're, you're, you're just getting a small piece of the picture. Now, if you start cropping a picture, uh, obviously you're going to lose some resolution. But a lot of our really high-end cameras these days have like 24, 50 uh, meg megapixels. And, and so if you're cropping you know, that to 1 50th of its normal size, you still have a 1 megapixel picture. So you're taking 1, pe one megapixel out of 50. But guess what? one megapixel is still not bad again if all you're trying to do is put something up on, on Facebook or Instagram uh, you can get you know a, a, some nice quality out of one megapixel so it, it's 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 this sort of technical desire to be you know uh, really really good at things before you you you, you give up uh, on, on your, your equipment so you know the bird's too far away, take the picture anyways and, and, and zoom in and you might be very surprised at what you can get. The, the key is to make sure the bird is properly exposed and really, really sharp so that you know you weren't moving your camera and, and the bird wasn't moving and, and so on. So get a nice crisp picture and you'd be surprised at what you can do without having to have all the fancy equipment. A macro lens is a very special lens that lets you get really, really close to things. So now if you want to get something, you know, let's say the the eye of a dragonfly and, and fill your entire frame with that, well, <clears throat> macro lenses are, are the types of things that let you get really, really close. Kind of like a form of telephoto, but instead of being able to see things far away, you literally are moving up so close that the item is almost like a, you know, a half an inch away from the front of your lens. So uh, it's, it's a very special type of, of lens, but it's very, very popular with the, the, the nature people who, who love to get close-ups of, of, of birds uh, that are, are, are 
not, not birds, birds' feathers that are on the ground or, or, or a, a frog that isn't running away or uh, uh, insects that are on a flower, that kind of stuff. And then there's a whole host of specialty lenses out there that do different types of things. Tilt shift lenses and things like that that are used for architecture and, and so on. And, and so the one piece of the lens stays on the camera and the front piece of the lens, instead of just being rotated you know, for focus purposes, the lens actually can lift up or down. Uh, there are lenses that automatic, that create distortion. You almost think, well, think of like a kaleidoscope type of effect. Uh, we're not going to discuss a lot of those types of things, but there's there's a host of, of very very special lenses that you might use once or twice a year, unless you're you're a photographer that specializes in a very unique type of thing like um, you know architecture and so on. Uh, so I've covered this a little bit. Um, this is the whole concept of you know fixed focal length versus variable it would be sharper versus it's designed for a certain focal length I didn't mention weight that's obviously a, a different uh, factor a zoom lens can be heavier because it's got you know a lot more pieces to it but at the same time if you have one zoom lens that's replacing five lenses that's certainly going to be lighter than five individual prime lenses but if you're just looking for a, a quick you know I'm going on holidays I want something you know nothing too fancy you can have a very small camera with a 50 millimeter lens and that's it you just you, you use that one lens for everything and you know you have the, the lightest possible combination you want to get a little heavier maybe go to a zoom lens from let's say uh, 35 to 80 <clears throat> now you've got a range of, 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 of uh, lenses and it's a little bit more than your 50 millimeter lens prime it's a moderate zoom but it's 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 still uh, heavier than your prime lens or your sorry your main 50 millimeter lens but at the same time it's 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 lighter than wearing you know bringing three lenses and more convenient uh, prime tends to be a lot brighter so it's not unusual to get uh, lenses that are like you know 1.8 1.2 even 2.8 is, is, is very typical where zooms it's not unusual to have zooms that only start at f4 and we'll talk about what that means in a little while but bottom line is the, the the prime lenses tend to be able to see in the dark much easier and as a result it gives you something called bokeh which we'll talk again about uh, and that's you know making sure that your background is, is soft and creamy and, and, and it's a look that a lot of people like so some people like the prime lenses just for that reason alone is they, they, they love them how the background looks for their flowers and their landscapes and so on um, and so this memorized field of view, that kind of changes. It depends on the quality of the zoom, but bottom line is, is uh, some lenses have what they call breathing. The, the, the lens breathes. So as you start changing your, <clears throat> your, 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 uh, your focal length, the, the, what you're seeing in the picture starts to, to, to shift and, and, and it starts to, to uh, affect your depth of field, your composition, there's a couple of things that are happening all at the same time when you start zooming. So, um, any questions at this point in time? Everyone still good? I'm just gonna grab whoops, I went the wrong way. All right. <coughs> I was just keeping uh, trying to bring up the chat. Okay, so here's examples of wide-angle lenses. Um, the, the one on the right is a, a good uh, sort of panorama type thing or, or whatever. I didn't show it full width, but it's you know obviously landscape type stuff is what you're you're looking at. And here's a wide angle that I took uh, in Ottawa, and, and you can see sort of you know how it exaggerates the things in the foreground or her legs in this particular case, but it's giving us this panorama effect of, of the the building that's being behind her. Uh, which is the Senate, <clears throat> and so you, you're, you're getting a very distorted view of the world, but it, it produces some dramatic results. The telephoto lenses let you get things that are far away, so this parrot uh, was, was uh, I couldn't tell you, uh, a teeny little bird far, far in a tree, far away when we were in Costa Rica, uh, and so <laughs> Yeah, I, I not only used a telephoto, but uh, I, I had to crop it quite a bit to be able to get you know that that particular bird. Whereas the yellow one on the right, uh, that bird was probably maybe 10, 15 feet away from me, but it was the teeniest little thing. I mean, that, that bird was probably you know 
the size of my thumb. Uh, it was a very, very teeny thing in, in a little bush. So that's kind of the typical, you know, wide angle telephoto type, type shots. And macro is the stuff that really, really, really gets up close. So these are dew drops on a rose petal and, and just the, the tips of drill bits in my, in my workshop. Uh, so it's, it's the type of stuff where you start to get really, really close and, and you're trying to um, magnify things, essentially. Uh, we sometimes talk about macro as being, you know, one-to-one, -one, whereby the image that you're photographing is as big as the image on the film plane or on your sensor. Once you start getting beyond one-to-one, -one, that means the things that you're shooting are, in fact, bigger on the, in the camera than they were in real life. I mean, clearly, if you go this way, this is the opposite, right? That bird is nowhere near what it was in real life. The bird is much bigger than my camera, you know, so obviously it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about flash now. Everything we've talked about with lenses and cameras, etc., is, you know, the light going through the lens and hitting the film plane. You can do that whenever you've got available light, and it doesn't matter what it is. That available light could be a match, it could be a candle, it could be the bright sunlight outside, it could be your 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 kitchen lights, uh, it could be um, anything you find in in the world that's that, that is visible to our eyes. <coughs> when that light is insufficient or undesirable, then you can produce your own light. And we've started introducing flash was 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 the thing that we we, we used for a long time. Um, with movie cameras and and DSLRs and whatever that are starting to create uh, movies, people are now starting to move a little bit away from flash and starting to introduce continuous light in the form of LED panels and LED lights, so that they can have a continuous source of light, and and shoot movies. So bottom line is is either flash or continuous light you know there's ways of augmenting your light and your ability to control that and be able to create the light that you want when you want is is going to really change your photography uh, if you're a natural light photographer and somebody wants portraits done at 10 o'clock at night well you, you better use the room lights because there's no sun outside to 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 deal with uh, if you're in the wintertime in Ottawa, then, you know, the sun goes down pretty early. Um, if the, it's a really cloudy day, etc., you're not going to get bright, you know, beautiful sunlight uh, images. So by, by being able to control your light, you can put the light where you want, when you want. So if you're doing boudoir work and, and the bed's not positioned at the right place relative to the window, well, it's very hard to move the window and to rearrange the room to move the bed to where you want it, etc. It's, it's tough to do, so you're much better off to be able to introduce your own light. And so the ability to add flash is, is going to change your, uh, your photography quite a bit. Uh, the ring light that's in front of the cat there is one that we would use for macro, so if you want to get really close to insects and that kind of stuff, that would be you know sort of the, the type of thing you would do for that. The, uh, the other two flashes on the right are, are speed light type of flashes that you would use for just opportunistic things, you know, birthday parties or your weddings and that kind of stuff. And the big umbrella with, the, with the, the, the big flash is the type of thing that you would do in a studio if you want to do glamour, fashion, uh, you know, uh, cosplay, portraits, that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of range of different lights for, uh, for different purposes. And, and they will change your, your photography quite a bit if you care to venture into that, that world. So this is a blend of natural light. The street, street lights behind us is, is there, but you know, she certainly would have never been that bright in, you know, at, at nighttime. This is like probably 10 o'clock at night. So here's a little bit of flash that was popped in here to kind of blend in and fit in with the, the rest of the light. So we need to understand exposure not just from a camera perspective, but a flash perspective and, and, and use the two of them together. Today, what we'll be doing though, is we'll be focusing on the light that hits your camera on a natural basis as opposed to uh, flash. And essentially the way the light hits the camera is the camera, the light hits, goes through the lens. It goes through an opening called an aperture. And then there's something called a shutter that actually turns the light off or on, or it turns off the visibility of the light off or on, and then it hits your, 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 your camera sensor. Once upon a time, that sensor used to be film. Now it's, it's, it's all digital. 
but the shutter and the aperture together control the amount of light. So the aperture is really, think of it as a straw, you know, you're kind of, you know, you're sucking the light through a straw. If it's a very, very small straw, you got to work hard to get the light through because it can't get through, it's a very small opening. If it's wide open, then the light can get through, pour through. The shutter, on the other hand, is how long the light hits the, the, uh, the camera sensor. So you talk about a one second exposure or a half second exposure or one tenth of a second exposure. That's how long the light is hitting the shutter. And so that's where we, we're going to be spending time. And we're going to be looking at the this, this shutter and this aperture. And in your camera, it's really talking about, you know, F8 is, is an example of, of the uh, a measure of the aperture and how open it is. And 40 is a measure of how long the uh, picture is being exposed or your sensor is being exposed and, and these are both uh, reciprocals so really you know 40 is really 1 40th of a second and so if you see a number that like 200 it's 1 200th of a second and if you see a number like 1000 it's 1 1000th of a second so that's what you're really seeing when you see that that, that number in the back of the camera and then f8 f16 f whatever why I say it's a it's a it's a it's a fraction is because f8 in fact is a bigger number it's 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 more wide open than f16 f16 is a very very small aperture whereas f8 is a bigger aperture and so on so um, we'll 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 get into some of that so this whole business of aperture and shutter and ISO we talk about something called an exposure triangle. Exposure triangle really says, how much light do I need to get my picture to be acceptable to me, okay, to, to my eye? So if I don't have the right combination of shutter, priority, and ISO, then what's going to end up happening is the picture is going to be way too dark. And I'm going to look at my photo and go, oh, it's underexposed, yuck. If the uh, picture is, is at the opposite end and it's way too bright, then I can look at it and say, oh my gosh, it's overexposed. You know, everything's too bright and there's no detail. It's all washed out. So I'm looking for that balance in between, which is just right. And I get that by playing with my aperture, my shutter, and my ISO. So that's the, the, the goal is, is to get the right balance. And so we have a couple of decisions to make. And this chart, and by the way, I just posted on the Meetup site, on the event page, these slides. So these slides as a PDF are available to you. Uh, it's just a link on the, uh, on the site. And so if you look at the right-hand side, <clears throat> you have shutter, and you have an eighth of a second, a fifteenth of a second, a thirtieth, a sixtieth, one over 125, all the way down to one thousandth of a second. So. The longer you leave the shutter open, so an eighth of a second, you'll get more light. It's brighter. You see the, the, the backwards arrow saying brighter uh, on the right-hand side of the uh, triangle. Whereas if you start moving to a thousandth of a second, the picture gets darker and darker and darker. But the, the, the little man there that's, that's kind of running, you can see at one eighth of a second, he looks blurry, or he or she or whatever that is, uh, is blurry. Whereas you move towards a thousandth of a second and they're, they're much sharper. Well, the faster the shutter opens and closes, the less likely that something that's moving, either the camera moving or your subject moving, uh, you're going to get much sharper, crisper pictures. So there's an advantage to moving towards a faster shutter speed to make sure that your picture is nice and sharp and crisp. So that's you know a good thing to have. And so if you can shoot with a higher shutter, great. Brightness is the opening of the, the, the aperture is the next factor in the brightness. And if you have your lens wide open and the light's coming through as much as possible, f1.4 you know, in this example, then you're getting as much light as you possibly can and you get a nice bright image and that's great. If you start closing down the aperture more and more and more towards f16, then you're restricting the light coming in no matter how long the shutter is open. The point is you've restricted the light coming in and so it's going to be a darker picture. Well, that's that's good, in, you know, in that you know, you want to control the light so that you get the right exposure. But there's a trade-off to be made, and we'll talk about something called depth of field in, in, in a little bit. But whenever you're changing your aperture from f2 to f2.8, uh, f4, f5.6, etc., etc., 
the depth of field affects how much of the photo is sharp from the front of the lens to the back of the lens. Okay, so a flower in the foreground might be sharp, but the background, maybe the mountains are a little bit uh, blurry, or the, the mountains might be very crisp if you want to focus on the mountains, but the flower isn't. So if you want to be able to get everything in the image front to sharp, back, you need to move towards f16. If you want to just focus on a person and their eyes and have everything, you know, else in their background be nice, soft, and creamy, then you want to shoot closer to f, you know, 1.4 or f2. So you're, you're making a decision in terms of sharpness, okay, in terms of foreground to background sharpness with aperture. And so you get those two things, and they're the main things that you will control. But once in a while you get stuck. You, you're, you, you're, you're, you're in a dim location and therefore you can't use f16, so you're stuck to use f, you know, f2. And the people, unfortunately, are, are moving around. It's a birthday party for kids and, and, and low light, and, and the kids are moving around quickly. So you'd like to use one one thousandth of a second, but of course you can't because you, you, you've already gone as, white, as bright as you can with the aperture. You're trying to, to freeze the action with the shutter, and, and you find that you can't make that trade-off. So the next factor to look at is something called ISO. And ISO is kind of like turning up the volume on the light. It's artificially magnifying the light for the camera. It's like turning up the volume on your stereo. When you turn your stereo volume way up too loud, then you start to get distortion in your speakers and so on and so forth. And the same thing happens on, in the camera. You start turning up the ISO and you start getting, getting something called noise. And a lot of photographers are really, really paranoid about getting too much noise in their photo. And I think that's very unfortunate because, you know, I've never had a client say to me, you know, uh, how come your pictures are so noisy? I mean, the, the people who don't understand photography don't even know what that is. But they do look at little Joey and say, how come all my pictures of Joey are blurry? I mean, <laughs> and I can't say your little brat didn't stay, stand still. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't take a good picture. So I'd rather introduce a higher ISO and get the photo that I want and need rather than having to, to you know, pray and hope that you know, I, I, I didn't shake the camera too much or the subject didn't move too much or, or so on. So these three things work together uh, to produce the right images and how they work together can either be under your control or under the camera's control. Now this is, uh, several of you at the beginning uh, were saying you'd like to, you know, learn more about, you know, uh, taking the camera and not always using it in auto mode. And there's nothing wrong with using it in auto mode, but there's many auto modes and choosing the one for the situation is probably important. So, in the center there, there's something called program mode. And that's usually P, and P doesn't stand for professional, it stands for program mode, and it's the easiest one to use. If you don't know too much about photography and you want to just take some fun pictures and you'd like the camera to do all the work, P mode is, is the way to go. What's going to happen is the camera is going to look at the image, it's going to see what you see through the lens, and it's going to evaluate how bright the picture is, whether it's a birthday cake or whether it's a, you know, sunny beach day and it's going to choose the shutter speed, it's going to choose the aperture, it's going to choose the ISO and it's going to give you an acceptable exposed image. Is it creative? Is it you know something dramatic that you've created uh, with artistic vision? Yeah, maybe not, but it's a good picture. And if you're trying to get something in the spur of the moment and you're not sure what's happening and there's too many things happening all around you, uh, nothing wrong with using program mode because it will give you uh, literally in, in, in one ten thousandth of a second it'll make all the evaluations and all the adjustments and give you a photo. Now <clears throat> is it going to make the right adjustments? Maybe not but it's going to give you something that works. If you want to influence it a little bit and you say look I'm doing sports and, and, or I'm doing kids and I want to make sure that you know these people who are running around are as sharp as possible then you can go to shutter priority. Shutter priority means I want the camera to shoot at a certain shutter. So you're choosing one one hundredth of a second or one one tenth, one one thousandth of a second. Uh, you're deciding what the shutter should be and the camera will then figure out 
what the ISO and the, and the uh, aperture would be. So you've taken one of the elements and brought that under your creative control and let the camera do the rest. So again, it's not going to be super artistic, etc., but you know that you're going to get pictures that were all shot at one 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 thousandth of a second because that's what you set it to, and therefore <clears throat> you will have no no well minimal um, movement uh, in, in the picture. Right, the people who are running will be appear to be frozen. They'll be appear to be still as opposed to being being blurry because they were moving. So that's that's your shutter priority. So you want to choose that whenever things are moving quickly and you're trying to freeze the action. So, um, aperture priority means I want to be able to set the aperture and let the camera choose all of the rest. So you would choose aperture priority, for instance, if you're up close to, um, uh, let's say you're, 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 you're a hobbyist and you, you've done some, some uh, some carving and you've got something in front of you here you've carved this beautiful statue or whatever it's in front of you and you want the statue to be crisp from the front of the statue to the end of the statue you don't want part of it to be blurred and part of it to be sharp so you would tell your camera i want to shoot at f16 and the camera would do what it needs to do to be able to shoot at f16 and then it would pick all of the rest so you're choosing depth of field as your your important uh, factor and the camera does, you know, as you request it and shoots at your shutter, at your aperture, and it does the rest. And if you um, instead say, I want to shoot a person and I want them to be crisp and sharp, but I want everything else to be soft and blurry and I'm looking for this you know, dreamy type look, well, you would pick an aperture priority and you would say, I want to shoot this at 1.8 and let the camera do all of the rest. So you pick the 1.8 and the camera does the rest. Manual says, I'm going to pick everything. I'm going to pick the, the, the aperture, I'm going to pick the, uh, the shutter speed, and usually I'm going to pick the ISO. There's a way for many cameras nowadays to say, I'm going to be manual, but I'm going to leave my ISO as automatic. Well, that's kind of another form of automatic. And, and there might be times when you want to do that, but you know it becomes your choice as well. You can say, I'm going to pick the shutter speed, I'm going to pick the aperture, but unfortunately the sun's going in and out of the clouds and I don't have time to start measuring and figuring out how bright the picture should be because the, the sun keeps moving and I'm in the middle of this, this party or this wedding and, and I, I, I want to control the aperture, I want to control the shutter for, for, for artistic reasons. Uh, or practical reasons. I mean, I, I just only have so much light to work with and I, I know people are moving and so on. So in order to get non-blurry pictures, I want to control both aperture and shutter. But the light keeps shifting, unfortunately, because of the, uh, the, the cloudy day. And so I want the ISO to be automatic because I don't have time to fiddle fart around and, and, and measure my exposure, etc. So th there are times to do each. And then a lot of the cameras, uh, have a whole bunch of other automatic modes as well. Portrait mode, landscape mode, macro mode, sports mode, night photography, child mode, food mode, the, the list goes on and on. Each camera tries, manufacturer tries to make their stuff um, unique. Bottom line is those are all cool. The, 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 the challenge is you never know exactly what they're doing because it's not published by the manufacturers, right? If you have something called, you know, uh, night portrait mode, what exactly is the camera doing? Like what shutter speed is it picking? What aperture is it picking? What ISO is it picking? We don't know. It's just a form of automatic, but the camera at least now knows that this is supposed to be a night shot. So it's not going to try to make it overly bright because it says, well, it's a night shot. It's supposed to be mostly dark with you know a few things that are bright. So it evaluates the overall scene and picks a uh, a combination of exposure settings that makes it look like a successful night shot. If you took night portrait mode and you started shooting a skier on a ski hill, the camera would do terrible things to you <laughs> because it's going to say, oh, this is supposed to be a night shot. Then it would try to make that snow as dark as possible. And that's not right. Whereas if you had, and I don't see it on the list, but if you had sand and snow as a mode, it knows that it's supposed to be a lot of white and it's going to make the exposure so that the snow or the sand or whatever you are is, is, is mostly white and the other things will be of relative uh, exposure. So all you're trying to do is say to the camera, stay in automatic mode, but I'll tell you 
I'll give you a hint at what you're shooting. You're shooting macro, you're shooting landscape, you're shooting a portrait, and the camera will then know to make a slightly more intelligent guesses than if it was in pure program mode. So that's how these things uh, end up working. So unless there's questions, we're going to leave all of that and we're going to start focusing on manual mode and we'll start looking at you know what do you need to do as a photographer to pick each of these, these various modes. Okay, so um, the auto that, that we talked about, if you don't have time to play with anything, weddings, photojournalism, street photography, unpredictable light, let the camera do the, the, the auto, right? Program mode, scene mode, all of those the modes, they, they, they will work. And your light and camera make those decisions with a little bit of information. If you say I'm doing you know food photography or snow photography or whatever, if there's a snow mode, uh, or a macro mode, then at least you, you're, 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 you're hinting at the camera. Aperture priority we talked about, you pick f4 and it does the rest. And here's an example of depth of field. If you take a look at these pencils, if I'm focusing on the front red pencil and I'm shooting at f8, if I'm successfully focused on the front red pencil, it will be sharpest and all of the others will start to disappear and, and become softer and softer as I move into the distance. F6, maybe a few pencils are sharp. F11, you know, a few more and F32, presumably, you know, hopefully all of the photos, all of the, the pencils are sharp. So the, the smaller your aperture, the smaller, the closer you get to f32, f64, very few lenses have f64. Most of your lenses will go from 2.8 to f16. A more expensive lens will have f32. <clears throat> a very expensive lens might have an f64. And the same thing at the other end. A, lo a lot of lenses shoot 2.8. Few lenses have 1.8 or 1.4 or even 1.2 would be a very expensive lens. So the between 2.8 and 16 is pretty normal, and then the, all the others are, are start to get you know into some fairly fancy uh, cost. So, um, if you're looking to have everything sharp from front to back, then sometimes you need that for 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 record keeping purposes. I mean, if you're shooting close ups of, of stamps or, or coins for a, a, an album or a collection, they better be you know crisp and sharp. You can't afford to have part of the, the, the coin a little bit blurry. <clears throat> uh, same thing if you're doing small you know jewelry. I mean, a, an ad for a diamond ring would never have a portion of the ring sort of being blurry. <clears throat> so you need uh, very small apertures for that type of stuff. Uh, if you're looking for more artistic stuff where, you know, you've got sort of a flower, someone's holding a flower, the flower is sharp, but the person in the background is, 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 is you know, dreamy and soft, or you're doing boudoir and, you know, her eyes are very soft and the rest of her body sort of, you know, goes off into, you know, <clears throat> a very soft focus, then, then now you're being more artistic and you're shooting around 2.8. So you'll see that on your camera <clears throat> as your f11 or f2.8 or f5.6. And the AV is aperture priority uh, in in the um, in this particular camera. Uh, A is the the mode for. If you go back here, you'll have AV in the um, Canon world, and you'll just have A in the Nikon world. And I don't know what it is for Sony. I don't remember. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of the person's sharp, but the background has gone soft. And that soft light in the background, a lot of people really like that creamy light is referred to as bokeh. And so you're shooting at very wide open apertures to get that kind of effect. Okay, if you have um, something in the foreground, anything that's not where her eyes are, anything before her eyes or anything far behind her eyes will be soft if you're shooting with low depth of field. Low depth of field means there's not a lot of depth to what's in focus. If you shoot with a higher depth of field, then you'll you'll have a picture like the the one on the right, and you'll get into um, you know everything being sharp. You know the trees in the background. Actually, the trees in the background. If you look carefully, in the far far background, they even they're not super super sharp. You know you can see some green trees in the background that are a little bit soft, but uh, this uh, cherry blossom or whatever she's got there, apple blossoms are, are, are smooth. Now when you get the slides, check out this depth of field simulator. I'm just going to click on it very quickly. And it shows you 
what happens at different depths of field. So if I bring this person, I'm going to bring this person close. And then if you take a look at what's happening uh, to the to the depth of field at the very bottom, you see the depth of field is, is changing. It, it's, it's just surrounding her on both sides and now the depth of field is very wide. So here, low depth of field, 1.4, 1.8, something like that, and look at the buildings in the background. And as I start to change my, my depth of field and I start to go F64, then the building in the background becomes much sharper. So it's that type of thing. So the other thing that it's going to affect your depth of field is the magnification. If you are close to somebody and you have a very long lens, a telephoto lens, then the background changes very quickly from very, very soft to very, very sharp. And all I'm doing here is I'm changing f-stop to affect depth of field. I can also affect my, my uh, the, the, the distance uh, in terms of my, um, my lens, whether I'm using a uh, 47 millimeter lens like a zoom or I'm using a 300 millimeter lens. And then you can change a whole bunch of other factors as well. Uh, in this particular case, I can say I could, I'm doing portrait, I'm doing landscape. Uh, <clears throat> let me pick a different church, a different uh, background. Oops. Okay, and now I'm going to put somebody fairly close to the camera. And now I can just play around with, you know, what happens when I'm doing. So you don't have to actually own all these cameras to, to, to do that. But here, uh, look, she's, she, you know, if I get really, really close, the tree goes out of focus. Now the tree is in sharp in focus, and, and if I start zooming in on her face, I start seeing the tree gets more out of focus. The tree is kind of sharp here, but as I get closer and closer and closer to her, the tree gets more and more out of focus because she is very close to the camera, but the tree is far away. So there's a whole bunch of depth of field simulator here. You don't have to buy and own a whole bunch of lenses, but you can learn a whole lot about playing with these um, variables as you're going along and see the, the results. And there's other uh, simulators like this that, that will simulate things like you know, movement. If you see somebody running, how, you know, how fast do you have to go? There's, uh, there's a lot of tools out there to, to help you do that. But I want you to get the basics for now and then we can play with some of those. But this, this link is included in, in, your, uh, in your handout. So <clears throat> when you have high depth of field or low depth of field, you still have to decide what it is you want in focus, right? So you're going to have to focus on something. Your camera does a lot of the automatic focusing in the modern cameras. Uh, in, Ten years ago, there was no automatic focus. You literally had to dial one dial for your zoom and another dial for your focus, and you decided where to focus. Nowadays, the camera ties to do it for you, and the camera uses contrast to do that. So in your camera, there's a dot or some area that, that, that the camera is looking at and saying, I'm trying to focus on this. <clears throat> your best bet, if you want to really control the focus, is use a single dot and you put that dot where you want. Some people use multi-level dots and, and they, they, they just they push the camera shutter halfway down and like say five or six dots light up in, in your camera and it's going to light up on a couple of things. So it might light up on the face of the, your, your, your subject, it might light up on their coffee cup, it might light up on their knees. It's trying to figure out what it is that it can be focused on and it'll pick some stuff and say, this is what I'm focusing on. And where those dots light up is what the camera chose to light up. If you have somebody who's holding a cigarette you know, towards the camera, and the camera may choose to focus on the cigarette or may choose to focus on their, on their face. You know, like you don't have as much control if the camera's just picking the dots at random. It's another form of automatic. If you have a single focus point, you can move it where you want, but you should move it to an area that has contrast. So if I point that dot to the middle of my cup, there's not much contrast there. There's no texture, there's no color, there's nothing. If there was a pattern on the cup, it probably would have worked much better. But there's no pattern, and therefore it, it's 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 not going to be sharp. So I move the dot to the rim of the cup where there's a little bit of texture. I've got the the color of the 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 rim's got a little bit of a, a whiter white to it. Uh, there's a coffee behind it, and so on. So there's 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 certainly a lot more to control. If you're shooting people, typically you would move that dot right to their eye and and, and make sure that you you've got their eye in focus because the 
the eye is probably the most important aspect of, of any portrait. So with aperture priority or whatever, make sure that you're, you're, you're focused exactly where you need to go, especially if you're using low depth of field. With shutter priority, uh, what you want to be able to do is make sure you're freezing the action. And again, creativity comes in. If you can shoot at this waterfall with one third of a second, the water is going to keep moving during a third of a second and it's going to have this you know, angel hair effect and, and, and nice soft waterfall. Whereas uh, the 60th of a one, one over 600, one over 160, you're going to be freezing the water. And if you shot at one one thousandth, you would freeze it possibly even more. It's still got a little bit of a blurry texture. So you control how much things are, are frozen, waterfall, people running, people on bikes, uh, animals moving. I mean, you know, a kitten playing with, with a ball of yarn just isn't still, right? And so you need higher shutter speeds to be able to capture that. And you have to do a combination of things. You have to make sure that the, the, the subject is, is frozen with your shutter speed, and you have to make sure that you've used your, your focal point to point to whatever it is that's, that's, that's uh, important and, and capture that. Otherwise, you're, you're freezing the action in the wrong spot. It's not the right thing to, uh, to take a look at. Questions? I heard something. <laughs> All right, so noise is the last factor and noise is really how crisp the, the image is from a, from a, a um, uh, from from a pixelation perspective, uh, once upon a time with film, film had grain to it, and, and and film was really a bunch of chemicals on a piece of plastic that were light sensitive, and, and the size of the, the 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 chemical granules was was referred to as grain. In the digital world, we have pixels, but the pixels are only so big and they're only so accurate. And when the camera boosts the image. What ends up happening is the black pixels aren't quite black. They're, they're a blend of, of, of you know, oranges and blues and greens, and the camera's really not sure what it's looking at. Each individual pixel is trying to figure out what I'm looking at, and it can't because the, 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 the color, the, the, the light is just not strong enough, and it's trying to boost the, the, the signal. The new cameras are quite amazing because they can start shooting at, oh, 6,400 ISO, uh, 1,000, sorry, 128,000 ISO. Uh, they've gotten amazing. Once upon a time, film, uh, high, high speed film was 400 ISO way back when. Nowadays, we think nothing of shooting at 800 ISO, 1,600 ISO. <clears throat> and that is one thing if, if you, 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 we said earlier on real, you know, cameras or cameras or whatever, but it doesn't matter on the make or the model, but certainly the more recent cameras and the more expensive cameras tend to have much better sensors and do a much better job at dealing with noise and, and tend to have a lot less noise. So if you're shooting a lot of low, low, low light uh, images and you're trying to get images <clears throat> that are really crisp without a lot of noise, then that's maybe one reason why you, you have to move uh, to, to a, a fancier camera. It's got to do with the electronics and, and the sensitivity of electronics and so on. That's one, one, one example where, where the camera is recording light, that's all it does, but there's not enough light to be recorded, then the camera will try to magnify it and its accuracy in magnifying the, that light is what produces, or lack of accuracy in magnifying that light is what will produce all of this, this noise that we talk about. Now again, you can clean up that noise in, in Photoshop and other tools. And what it tries to do is average the pixels and, and, and eliminate some of that, you know, sort of uh, graininess that you see in the background, particularly in the dark areas. If you look beside the hair, <clears throat> anything that's black typically is, is what gets noisiest. Uh, the face tone, the skin tone for this doll and whatnot is not too, too bad, but it's, it's, it's in the blacks that you really see the, the most noise. So your ability to tolerate noise is really a, a personal taste thing. But again, I'd rather have the noise than have a, a blurry picture. Um, so when you're shooting, you typically will say, do I need to freeze the motion? Set my shutter speed. Once I've set my shutter speed, how much light do I have? And so then you might go and play with your aperture. If you have 
room with your aperture and you want high depth of field, go for it. You know, go to f16. If you can't go to f16 because there's not enough light, well, then you have to shoot it, you know, f4, f2.8 or whatever. If you've opened up your camera all the way and you've said, okay, I, I froze frozen the action at one one five hundredth or whatever you had to, <clears throat> and now I've, I've uh, opened up my camera as wide as I can and I've got to 2.8, which is as far as I can go with my lens, and it's still too dark, well, now your, your, your next option is to start bumping up the, the ISO. And you typically you would start with an ISO of 100 or 200, whatever is, is uh, lowest in your camera. And then start bumping it up to, you know, 400, 800, 1600, 3200 until the, the picture is, is, is sufficiently bright. And now you've made a completely manual picture where you chose the aperture you chose the uh, shutter speed, you chose the ISO, and then you get the, the result that you're looking for. So the noise is, is, is certainly a factor to consider, and you can see, you know, sort of as the ISO goes up, the, the amount of noise increases, and that will change by camera. But again, you know, a noisy picture, maybe aesthetically is not what you want, but, you know, something which is, is visibly, you know, uh, uh, visibly unsharp because of movement or because you, you didn't focus properly is, is, is equally unacceptable. All right, so we talked about how to get all of this um, in manual mode and we talked about automatic modes, but as a photographer you can, ex you can use creativity to, 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 to force the image to be whatever it is you want. Uh, you make it a little darker, you can make it a little bit lighter, it's, it's a matter of, of doing it to taste. Well, when the camera's choosing in aperture priority or in shutter priority the right exposure, <clears throat> unless you're using one of the special modes, like I'm you shooting snow or I'm shooting landscapes or I'm shooting night portraits, if you just use A or V, uh, A, V, A, uh, um, or S for, for um, shutter or A for pri or, or aperture, uh, or the T mode for, for time exposure. I mean, all of these automatic modes that we talked about. The camera is looking at the picture, it doesn't know what it's looking at, and it can't tell whether you're photographing a white cat, a gray cat, or a black cat. So it assumes all cats are gray. You shoot a picture like we have down below, and it says, I'm seeing something, I don't know what it is, and it's going to make it more or less gray. It doesn't quite make it this beautiful white snow. If you want it to be white, then either you go to manual and you, you choose the exposure you want, or you say to your camera, I know I'm going to be outside, it's a nice winter day, I'm shooting outdoors, and just about anything I shoot is probably going to have a fair degree of snow in it. So I'm going to change my exposure compensation and make it one and a half stops brighter. And you choose whatever you're going to choose. It doesn't matter whether the sun's out, the sun's gone behind a cloud, whether it's getting a little dark and it's dusk and it's a little dar uh, darker outside. You figure out what the exposure is and whatever you think it is, make it just a little bit brighter. So what you have is on your camera, if it's a, a Nikon, you've got this plus minus sign in the top right. If it's a Canon, you have like an AV plus minus button. Either way, you push those buttons and then you you roll your dial and what ends up happening is on the bottom right here you'll see your camera moves and you see the plus minus right down here whoops uh, right down here you'll see rather than moving at zero this little little dot is going to move over here and over here it says it's going to the minus it says whatever you think it is make it one stop darker okay or to get this picture that we have over here I would take this and I would go click, 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 and I would bring it to a right about here somewhere and say, I want it to be about one and a half stops brighter than whatever you think it is. So it's still going to be in shutter priority. It's still choosing one one hundredth of a second. It's going to pick the aperture, whatever it thinks it should be for that this brightness, but it's going to make it a little bit brighter because I've moved this a little bit over. So now you as a photographer are still in automatic mode, but you're, ex you're, you're exercising some creative uh, 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 shall we say some some creative control and telling the camera what to do with what it thinks is the right exposure. 
So now you can turn around and make sure that your night pictures are appropriately dark and don't get overexposed by going over here and saying, don't, don't make it like a medium gray. I know it's a nighttime shot, so make it a little bit darker. Or I know it's snow, make it a little bit brighter. And so you move your, 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 um, your exposure override to the plus or minus. Don't forget to set it back. <laughs> <laughs> because the next time you, in most cases, some cameras are, are different, but in most cameras, if you do it to take it to the off position and then you open it up again and you start taking pictures, it may remember the override from the last time you used your camera. So, you know, get that back to zero and make sure that this is sitting at zero if you start playing with this, this override compensation. Some cameras automatically, when you shut them off, set it back to zero and then the next time you, you 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 take pictures in the snow then it's got to set up again <clears throat> it's a it's, it's a matter of preference I mean you know some people shut off the camera take a few pictures turn it on take a few pictures shut it off take it on and, and so they're shutting the camera on and off and if it remembers these controls that's great from 10 minutes ago when I said I was shooting in the snow <clears throat> that's uh, I still I'm still shooting in the snow but if, if the camera keeps resetting it for you then, then be aware so this is the exposure compensation capability and it's not quite manual you know you're not in full control but in fact you have sufficient control so take a picture if it looks like this you're saying oh man it's looking a little on the dark side well then give yourself a little bit you can, don't have to go completely manual you can just override it and move it to plus one or plus one and a half maybe even two and and see you know if, if that's giving you a more pleasing picture so we talked about mirrorless cameras earlier as one of the new things that are out there. This is one of the places where the mirrorless cameras excel. So if you have a non-mirrorless camera, then what ends up happening is you take a picture and you get this picture over here and you get this gray and you go, oh darn. So then you got to take another picture and you, you, you change your settings and you look at this picture and you say, yeah, now I'm happy. So it's a matter of almost trial and error. Take a picture, see if you like it, look at it in the back of the camera, take another one. That's still not quite right. Take another one. Oh, now you've made the right setting. Now you're happy. With the mirrorless camera, this is happening in real time. If you are looking at the picture and it's looking like this through the viewfinder, you start twiddling your dials and start playing with your aperture and shutter and all of a sudden the picture starts getting brighter. So it's showing you in real time what the picture looks like. If I go back to my waterfall picture, if you have a certain shutter speed, it'll show you the water looking like this. If you change your shutter speed, it'll look like this. So the camera is showing you in the digital viewfinder, this is what the picture is going to look like if you were to put your sh push your shutter right now. So the mirrorless cameras give you a, a much more of a real time feedback. Not that you need that. Yeah, it's 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 a nice to have. We've 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 lived without them for a long time. In the film days, we would wait two weeks before we saw our picture. We didn't have the instant feedback, so we had to learn to to you know get all of this stuff right without knowing for sure if it was right for two weeks until you you, you got your photos back. So in the in the modern world, you can just take a picture, look at it, and, and make adjustments on the spot. The mirrorless is making the adjustments right in the viewfinder. You're seeing as you're twiddling your dials whether the picture is getting brighter or, or, or less bright uh, and, and is it getting too bright. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's what's happening. Now for the camera to decide here whether this picture is too dark or too light, uh, it's looking at the entire picture. Sometimes that's deceiving. If I have a picture like this one and the camera is looking at this window, it says, oh, there's lots of light coming in through the window and it reduces your exposure. It, it, it either you know, shortens your shutter, t shutter um, time or it reduces your aperture and you know, makes, the, makes the, the picture darker so that you know, what you can see out the window is, is appropriate. But your subject is looking way too dark because the camera's looking at the overall image and you sometimes want something which is not overall. You're willing to sacrifice what's in the window and make it look too bright in order to get the model or your subject in this particular case much more um, in the zone that you want. So a couple of different things you can do. Number one, uh, you can certainly adjust everything manually and, and deal with that until you're happy with the, the, the person uh, in, the, in the screen. Two, we talked about the little dot that you're going to use for focusing. Chances are you're not going to be focusing on that fence that's behind the window. You're going to be trying to focus on on the model. So you're going to take your the little dot that you use for focus and you're going to move it over 
and get line it up on top of your subject. When you do that, you're also telling the, the camera, this is what's important to me. I want to focus on this. And the majority of your cameras will also take the exposure from that dot position. Rather than looking at the center where the, the, um, where the, uh, the window is, it'll actually look mostly on the left right hand side here. And it'll focus on your subject as well as look at the exposure of your subject. So you have a bunch of controls in your camera matrix metering, center weighted metering, spot metering, evaluative metering, partial metering, etc. When you're choosing those, what you're saying to the camera is, do I just look at the dot where I'm focusing or do I look at something around it? So if you're doing matrix metering or evaluative metering, what, you're, what the camera's doing is it's looking at the entire picture and it's kind of like the, the uh, whoops, it's kind of like this picture on the left. Uh, where what's happening is it's looking at the entire picture, everything outside, the curtains, the, the model, and, and so on, and it's saying this is the overall average exposure that makes this picture look the best. Unfortunately, not to my taste, and probably not to yours either. Whereas if you go to spot metering, okay, this mode here, either that spot metering or that spot metering in Nikon, you're saying just look at this one spot. So is there a right or a wrong? The answer is no. It really depends on, again, your, your artistic uh, your creativity. If she was wearing, if you're using spot metering and you happen to be you know, on this person, is the exposure different if she's wearing a white dress or if she's wearing a black dress? I mean, the answer is no. There's the same amount of light that's landing on her and her dress and her face. But the camera will be thrown off because if you put that spot on her collar and it happens to be a white collar or a black collar, you're gonna, your camera is going to give you different results because it's seeing more light or less light depending on, on, on uh, what, uh, where the dot's landing. So sometimes you want something a little bit, not quite the dot, but the dot plus a little bit around it. So you're going to get whatever clothes she's wearing and then her face and a little bit of the curtain and a little bit of the, um, the background and it's going to look at an area around that dot and take it all into consideration. So depending on how contrasty your picture is, you may sometimes need to not trick your camera, but essentially entice your camera to look at one area more critically than all, all of the rest. So if the picture is you're taking is she's standing right smack in the center of the window and she's centered and everything's fine and that's the way you take your photos, great. But if you start putting your people off to the side and you start being creative with your, 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 uh, your composition, then you need to make sure your camera is, is not being fooled by the, the scenario looking in front of you. So there's, a, there's, there's some, some consideration there. Now, what's really nice is, is once you've had a chance to, to play with some of these things, we get out and we start doing photo shoots and we start doing things and I start giving you exercises. You know, when we say, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to flow in the forest and uh, I want you to take this particular, you know, uh, tree and, and frame it against the sky and I want the tree on the left-hand side and, and make sure that, you know, the, the tree's properly exposed and, and, and your sky is, 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 you know, just goes to where, where it is or we'll, take, we'll shoot a a model on a beach and we'll put her over on this on the edge of the the frame and and you know you got to get the sunset and the model and then get everything tied together so we we, we have some practical exercises as we go along so <clears throat> if you take some of the things we talked about together and you you start putting them uh sort of side by side what you end up with is a little cheat sheet that says if your photo's too dark well you got a number of options number one <laughs> you can increase your iso Okay, at the risk of giving you noise. You can decrease your shutter speed at the risk of giving you blur. And you can make it a smaller f-stop at the risk of giving you less depth of field. So, so you, these are the trade-offs you're making. But you have three things you can do if the photo's too dark. If the photo's too bright, uh, well, decrease your ISO, increase your shutter speed, smaller f-stop. If you're finding things are too blurry, well, you can increase your, your, your f-stop because of depth of field. You can increase your shutter speed to affect motion blur or you can try putting your camera on a tripod which affects photographer and camera movement it really doesn't help on a tripod if you've got somebody on horseback you know riding in front of you uh, at, at full gallop I mean a tripod doesn't help <laughs> right but it, it, it will affect your 
the steadiness of your camera if you have a telephoto lens shooting a bird in a distance and you're having a hard time holding the camera steady. Now we're getting into a technical combat, uh, technical area. <clears throat> Let me just stop here for a moment and just say, how are we doing on the questions? Quiet, everybody. Yeah, everybody's still quiet. All right. Just wanted to be sure. I'm just going to move this over here. And I'll share my screen again. Okay, so we talked about brightness, um, something's too bright, something too dark, etc. Uh, most of your cameras have a feature called a histogram, and a histogram measures pixels. When you have a dark picture that's underexposed, you have a histogram that looks like the one on the left. And, and there's a whole bunch of dark pixels, and there's nothing in the middle, gray, and there's nothing in the bright. Whereas if you have a picture that's correctly exposed, then the histogram is going to be mostly in the middle. And if you have a very bright picture, the, the, the histogram is going to be on the far right. The reason this is important is because when you look through your viewfinder, you may find that the viewfinder just like uh, your, your, your computer screen, you can set the brightness on your computer screen. So if you set your viewfinder so bright, because it's a nice bright sunny day and that's the only way you can see it, uh, then the picture may look right, but when you get into your computer and you start processing it later, in fact, it was a little darker than you'd hoped. And conversely, if you know, your viewfinder is a little on the dark side or you're outside on a bright sunny day and you're not seeing the viewfinder as bright as you could, then you could think the picture is, is, is nice and bright and turns out it's actually darker than you thought. So your histogram is actually a very uh, uh, useful way to, to, to evaluate your picture and see if it's giving you what you want. Most people just say, well, I want to get the histogram in the middle, which is fair if it's an average picture, then you would get an average uh, histogram. So this one over here is a, a typical safe exposure, nothing too bright, nothing too dark. If you get something that's too, too bright, you're going to get a peak on the edge here, like this overexposed picture. And when you're at the far, far right like this, and, and it's against the wall of your histogram, unfortunately, that means your picture is highly overexposed. And you probably have in many of your cameras, something called the blinkies. And there's something blinking that's right white in your camera telling you, hey, this has got no detail. So no detail means that it's pure, pure white. If you were shooting a bride, then her gown would be pure white and you wouldn't see the lace, you wouldn't see the details, you wouldn't see anything in that gown. She would look like she's wearing a piece of white cardboard. If you're at underexposed, the, the histogram at the very top here, that's uh, you know up against the wall, everything's black. That means it's pure, pure black, no detail. So the groom's wearing a black tux and you're not gonna see the folds in his, material, in his jacket, you're not gonna see the texture of the material. Uh, you, he looks like he's wearing a piece of black cardboard. So neither all black or all white is, is, is appropriate. And if you get into Photoshop and it's pure black or pure white, you probably can't fix that either. Okay, The way Photoshop works is, is it tries to uh, adjust your exposure and make things a little bit brighter or not. But if it's pure black, then it's, it's, it's got zero lighting. And I don't care what you do to zero, if you can multiply it by five, five times zero is still zero, it's still going to be black. And if it's pure white, that's infinity. And I don't care if you reduce it by a half, half of infinity is still infinity, so it's still pure white. So you, pure black and pure white cannot be adjusted in, in um, post-processing. So you want to make sure that your, your, your histogram doesn't have a, a big bank on either side, unless that detail is not important to you. So <clears throat> this is a typical you know, histogram. There's nothing pure white here. Uh, the detail in the clouds are still there. There's nothing pure black. Maybe there's some detail in the black tree trunks over there that might be black that you don't care about. But that's, that's a good positive histogram. Here's a histogram that's on the dark side, but it's, it's appropriate because I'm still seeing a little bit of detail, maybe, you know, maybe lose a little bit of detail in his hat rim. 
Uh, maybe I've lost some detail in his tie, I don't know, but the picture has this, this dark, moody look, and I'm, I'm looking for a histogram that should look like it's on the dark side, it's film noir genre. If I were to shoot this in pure automatic mode with not any overrides, the camera would try to make this you know, a muddy gray. I wouldn't have any blacks with some punchy whites. So a pure gray image is not always appropriate. You want to be able to control the, the image to give you the, the, the picture you want. Here is a high key example of you know, lots of whites. There's no detail in the background. It was a pure white paper anyway, so there was no detail to be salvaged there. So can I afford to have the white, whoops, can I afford to have the white in the background um, you know, overexposed? Yes, I can. Can I make it too overexposed? No. If I make it too bright, then that white background becomes uh, its own light source and then her hair washes out and, and the picture gets very uh, muddy and so on. So here the detail though in the in the in the, the fur is still there and it's not overexposed to the point where I've lost the detail in the fur. But I mean that histogram is almost all on the right and it, it looks like a very abnormal histogram, but it's an abnormal picture. How often do you get a picture which is almost pure white like this with just splashes of, of, of uh, you know dark accents? Marcia said exposure compensation is not used on Annual? I don't know what that means. Oh, manual. Exposure cost. Oh, <clears throat> um, yeah. So when we were back here and we were using plus or minus, that's just going to affect the reading in your camera and it's going to tell you, I think it's too bright or I think it's too dark. But in fact, if you have aperture manually set, shutter pre uh, manually set, and ISO manually set, having this set to plus or minus two anywhere is not going to affect your picture. Okay, so that, that plus minus is only to influence aperture priority, shutter priority, uh, auto, hist auto ISO, it's only the, 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 the manual, sorry, only the automatic modes and the program mode. But if you earn manual, then you're correct. That has no, no impact whatsoever. Okay, so we're still good. I'm just keeping an eye on those questions. All right, so RAW versus JPEG. Most of you probably have RAW available to your cameras, and I highly recommend you use it. You may have a choice of RAW or JPEG, and you can have both. <clears throat> if you're going to do both, and your camera can afford, can, can, support, can support it, put the RAW on one card and JPEG on another, because it's a lot easier to just deal with just the RAW and not have to have the JPEG. Otherwise, what happens in Lightroom and a lot of other software <clears throat> is if you put it all on one card, then both the RAW and the JPEG get transferred to, to, to Lightroom and, and you're really never going to use the JPEG most of the time. You're going to use the RAW. So why do you want RAW? Well, RAW is the camera capturing the light on the sensor and putting that on the card exactly as it's been seen. It's not been processed. It's, it's, it's kind of like the old film negatives. It is what the camera saw <clears throat> and it is going to have the most detail. So the darkest darks and the whitest whites will all be preserved as much as possible. And if you did overexpose or underexpose a little too, a little bit, you could probably fix it much better with RAW. You have a higher uh, image quality, you have a higher dynamic range, which means the blackest blacks and the whitest whites are further apart. When you start doing anything with the camera and you start saying, oh, I want, uh, you know, I want the, the, the image to be a little crisper, like some cameras have a standard mode, a black and white mode, a, uh, uh, a vivid color mode, and so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch of different modes. That's the camera punching up the colors or making things black and white or doing whatever, and it's doing that and storing it in the JPEG. And so the camera is doing some processing for you, and what it's going to do is proprietary to the camera, and it's already now a compressed image with a little bit less um, detail. So while JPEGs are very convenient, and, and we had a time when the photojournalists, for instance, would go out and shoot JPEG so that they could literally take the picture from the camera, send it over to the wire, and get it to an editor in a hurry, <clears throat> and the quality image maybe got, you know, 
came along a little bit later as raw. But the computers have gotten faster. Uh, we can now transmit, you know, raw images over uh, you know, wireless and, and, and whatever uh, with higher bandwidth. And so dealing with raw is no longer the, um, the, the burden it once was. You know, people can easily deal with, you know, uh, picture, pictures that are, you know, 10, 15, 20 megapixels, whereas the JPEG is like two or three megapixels. Uh, it's, it's, it's much smaller. So it, it degrades uh, much, much faster. And if you start editing your JPEG, so you open up the JPEG and you make it a little darker, a little bit lighter, or you crop it, or you, you, you use uh, Photoshop to remove, let's say, a distraction. Maybe there's a candy wrapper on the, on the grass that you want to clean up. Uh, anytime you open up the picture, make a change and save it, it's degrading further and further and further. So you know, every time you edit it, it's getting a little bit lower quality. So stick with your RAW if, if you can. If you've got a very slow computer or a very slow laptop and you find it's taking up too much space, well then, you know, maybe you, you have to deal with your JPEG. But, um, you know, you, you understand what you're sacrificing. So, you know, try to, 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 try to stick with what you can. Okay, so we are at 10 minutes to 10. Uh, I don't know that we're going to have a lot of time to go through this. So before I get into it, Anything else? Let's talk a little bit about proper exposure, expo uh, manual, auto, histograms, lens choice, mirrorless, non-mirrorless. Make sure that's all clear before we go anywhere else. Very quiet bunch over there. <laughs> okay, move on. All right. So the next step, once you've got your, 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 your settings the way you want, you've got the right aperture, shutter priority, etc. It doesn't matter how you got there, whether it was automatic mode or whatever. There are certain what we would call rules of thumb that, that help make your pictures a little bit more punchy. Uh, choosing the right angle and trying to get sort of you know, the, the, the image the way you want. Uh, involves some playing around and now you're not just playing around with the camera you're playing around typically with the camera position and with the choice of lens so that you can put things in the right place and uh, guide the viewer's eye so there are themes that we'll talk about there's various conventions we can talk about and there's things you know such as leading lines and selective focus and, and the use of contrast that give your picture a little bit more punch a little bit more wow mm -hmm. So the compositional styles are really using some of these what we call templates to position things in your frame. So if you want to use the rule of thirds, it's probably the most common one, is you would put the most important aspect of your image at one of the intersection points at the rules of third. Uh, same thing with the golden triangles, there's intersection points and that's typically areas where you would, you would focus the eye. <clears throat> They're not uh, mutually exclusive there's there's a whole bunch of different ways but if you have to line up something and you use these these rules of thumb then what they end up doing is they they your eye tends to recognize certain patterns and therefore they become more pleasing so there are just innate things in terms of being humans if we, are, we typically in, in North America we read from left to right and so our eye goes into the picture from the left and to the right so if there are nice leading lines in the photo your eye will follow them that type of thing so you know the butterfly is placed at the intersection of rule of thirds the eye of the model is placed at the intersection of the rule of thirds and that tends to to you know give us something that's much better and more pleasing just through 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 history and repetition than if you take the model and put her you know dead center or you took the butterfly and put it dead center so there's also leading lines in the case of the butterfly of, of, of there's a couple of branches that kind of lead your eye in towards the butterfly and so again they're introduced left to right you could have taken this picture and flipped it around and you would you would get a different mood or, or, or flavor from it the rule of thirds and the golden spiral and the triangles there are different ways of representing the same thing sometimes one works better than the other but you'll find that a lot of them are very similar and the same picture actually meets multiple rules or guidelines as you go along. Now when you have people if they're not necessarily all in the picture from head to toe so you need to decide to crop either in the camera as you're shooting or you're gonna to have to crop 
in Lightroom or Photoshop afterwards. And there's some general rules that say, well, you don't crop off the ears. You usually, you know, uh, don't want to crop at a joint. So you don't want to crop at the elbow or at the wrist or at the knees or at the ankles. You, you, you typically want to crop where the green lines are. And so you're including, you know, just the face. If you want to chop off a little bit of the head because you're in really, really close, you can do that. I mean, we see that with Maybelline commercials and, and, and you know, various types of glamour where we're, we're really, really close on the on the model's face for eye makeup and stuff. So the, the top of her hair is sometimes chopped off, but you rarely chop off the chin, for instance. You, you, you just This is not something that's visually appealing. Um, you typically wouldn't chop off at the joints. It, 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 looks, it looks bad. You would typically chop off just above the, the joints, so just above the elbows or just above the knees or just above the ankles. And again, this is just following another rule of thirds type thing. Uh, if you have somebody in the, sub in the frame or you have something that's moving, a boat, a bird or whatever, you want space for the person to look into the frame. You want a place for the bird to flow. So it's important to have just a little bit of room in the frame so that the person is not like looking like they're, 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 they're jammed up against the edge of the frame. <clears throat> Using perspective is a way to add drama to your photos. The, the worst photos are what we call bullseye vision, right? It was taken from eye level with the camera focused with the, the, the subject right smack in the middle and the picture was horizontal and not portrait. So, it, you know, every picture looks exactly the same. It's just, you know, a horizontal picture taken at eye level with the subject right smack in the middle. So if you want more interesting photos, get down really low and shoot up, get up high and then shoot down. And each of those will typically give you uh, a different perspective and, and a, a, another way to, to, to add interest to your pictures. Uh, as you're walking around, I mean, you're standing somewhere, you see something that's nice and, and it's a great scenery, but before you take that picture, what else can you put into the frame? You know, get low and include a flower in the foreground, uh, walk around and see that, oh gosh, you know, this nice garden I can actually see from, you know, the inside of a balcony and through a door. Uh, this landscape at uh, Red Rock Canyon, I was able to find a, a, a hole in one of the rocks and I crawled in and, you know, used the rock as a, a way of framing the picture. Uh, overhanging trees become another way of, of creating a little bit of, um, uh, a mask or, or a frame around your pictures so you know use the an overhanging tree to, to add some dimension and, and cut away some of the the excessive sky so these are, are framing <clears throat> um, contrast is a very important way to to bring attention to a picture your eye will travel to the lightest part of the picture so think about when you're lighting your picture or when you're looking at the way the light is hitting something look for things that get lit by the light and let the rest of it go dark and then expose for the highlights. So when you're in manual mode, don't try to picture, you know, uh, make the picture all overall gray. Try to make it so that the highlights are of the right intensity and let the darks go dark. You know, forget about, you know, what's in the, in the, in the, uh, in the shadows. Typically that's not the important area. Your eye travels to the brightest part. So make sure the brightest part have the right intensity. And while contrast is something that we usually think of as black and white, you can have color contrasts and harmonious colors and, and, and things that you see that, that blend nicely together will add interest to your pictures, whether it's a pattern or uh, some sort of a, a texture. <clears throat> so, you know, look for the, the, the color contrasts and, and use that to, to add some, something pleasant to your pictures. We talked about shutter speed to freeze motion but if you want, you can actually suggest motion, okay? And you need to do that carefully so that the picture isn't overall blurred. But the, these pictures have something moving in them and, and they have a little bit more interest because it's not just a static image. So to create the picture on the left, we, we, we were shooting outside and I was intentionally moving the camera, you know, from top to bottom. But as I was moving the camera, there was a pop of flash. And without getting into the technicalities, the pop of flash froze her, but the flash didn't reach the buildings that were, you know, 300 yards behind her, and therefore they weren't frozen. The, the, the lights of the buildings were, were moving. 
for the center one the the model was using a grinder and the sparks were flying so we're shooting at 1 15th of a second so that we could see the, the the trail of the sparks had we shot that at 1 1000th of a second the sparks would be nothing more than you know little dots of light like fireflies and for the runaway bride <clears throat> the bride is running but we're panning with her so we're moving with her and so she relative to the camera is more or less staying still she's always in the center of the camera but the background the 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 the, the, the trees behind her are moving relative to to her much faster so they get blurred and she stays rel relatively sharp i mean there's 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 some movement there but but you know enough that we can pan so panning is moving your camera with the subject and we at a bike or a car or whatever your subject will be relatively sharp compared to the background around it so motion adds a visual interest to a, to a photo so trying to freeze the motion all the time is not great the waterfall was another example of that with the angel hair type look leading lines is something that you use to create a sort of a, a way for your eye the, the your viewers eye to 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 find your subject so with the train obviously the bright light is a contrast type thing but the rails happen to be lit very nicely by that train light and I amplified them a little bit in, in, in post-processing as well so that my eye finds those rails and then leads up to the train and then my eye bounces around to maybe the bright spot on the uh, on the right hand side of the picture which has got some some light or something that's hitting a wall but your, your eye travels you know throughout that picture looking at all the bright spots the picture on the right uh, you know the, the hotel is very nice and, and if you were to crop out everything in the pool I mean it's it's an interesting building but when you add the lines of the pool your eye sweeps through the pool follows that the, the lines around and don't stay in the pool they, they end up going back up to the building so your eye will follow lines and treating you know in, in flowing through the images if you're photographing people your subjects and where they're looking will draw the attention of the viewer so if you have somebody who's standing looking at you uh, your your eye goes to their eye and they're, they're they're engaging with you you know through the photo but if you have a fashion model for instance they typically don't look at you because they want you to look at the fashion so the model will be looking off in the distance and if the model is holding a trinket a piece of jewelry or whatever she's looking at the jewelry your eye will also go to the jewelry as well so it's 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 going to um, draw your, your 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 eye because you're looking to see what they're looking at diagonals are also another you know uh, important theme I mean strong strong lines running diagonally through the picture as opposed to a leading line leading you in gives the picture a, a dynamic sort of impact uh, so if you have a strong diagonal then, then it, it typically gives the picture a little bit more punch than, than just straight up and down left and right uh, selective focus again we, we, we do that with a aperture which is very very large right f 1.8 f 2.8 and that really focuses the camera in one spot and everything else goes soft so selective focus is, is a good way to kind of draw your atten viewers attention your eye will always go to the piece of the image which is the sharpest so you know choose your focus properly and your viewer will follow your uh, intent in terms of where it's going the picture on the left also follows another theme called the major minor theme where you have the major version of a something and then you've got a smaller version or you know kind of in the background that helps produce a bit of a repeating pattern so uh, let's just wrap up with you know technically if you want to get great pictures and, and, and people who learn in camera clubs and whatnot who, who want to get ribbons and awards for pictures they're measured on a couple of factors the number one thing they're measured on is technical excellence is the picture properly exposed is it suitably sharp are there any distractions or anything that I don't want in there so technically it's a good picture so that's the first thing they're measured on and they're given points on that then artistic measure merit is the next thing is the picture pleasing is it effective uh, you know is your is your uh, horizon uh, straight or, or did you you know tilt the, the, the ocean or the building or whatever uh, is there a strong pattern strong interest do I know what I'm looking at you know, if you just give me a picture of a forest and I go, what am I looking at there's just a blur of trees here you know what is this is it, is it a pattern or is it something you know specific 
uh, and does it have a certain mood or, or is there something that's that's helping me stay you know in touch with the uh, the subject so that's the artistic merit and then there's the wow factor you know does it have strong power uh, in terms of color does it have impact uh, is this an unusual way to see whatever the Grand, Grand Canyon or this flower or this landscape or is it just I've seen a million others just like it so this is uh, what what people are looking at so uh, we talked about what you need to do for technical excellence and we, we, we skimmed over some of these other little details of, of artistic merit and, and wow factor, but uh, that could be the subject of another topic. You know, leave me your notes, let me know what it is you, you want to see for future sessions. And uh, we will wrap up with that and I'll open it up to any last minute questions. Still checking the chat. Very quiet group. <laughs> All right. We're good. All right. Seeing some comments. Thank you. Good review. Learning new things. That's excellent. I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> and somebody just unmuted. Michelle, question? Oh, no, no. That's, I just wanted to say it was very, very nice. I really enjoy, and, and that's a lot to take in. I think the the slides will be very helpful yep. to review it. Yeah, so the slides are already posted, and I'll, there'll also be a video if you need to, you know, listen in and and, and uh, capture this okay. 